Hi, I'm Jeremy Allison with Google's Open Source Program Office and I'm here at the Free Software Foundation's Libra Planet Conference here in Boston. And I'm very lucky to be here with Karen Sandler, who is the Executive Director of the GNOME Foundation. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> so, Karen um, originally was a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center and then moved over to being the Executive Director of the GNOME Foundation, taking over from Stormy Peters, who I interviewed uh, a few years ago. So, Karen, could you tell us a little bit more about the GNOME Foundation and what it is that you do for free software? Sure, and actually, I am still a lawyer, so you made it sound like I, I was a lawyer, and maybe uh, people would like me better if I weren't still a lawyer, but, uh, but I am, and actually, uh, the legal work that I do now is almost entirely pro bono work at the Software Freedom Law Center still, even though I no longer work there, and also for Conservancy, and also for QuestionCopyright.org, and I'm also, um, just recently have become an advisor of the Ada Initiative, which I'm really excited about. But you asked about the GNOME Foundation, which I'm the executive director of, and um, I'm the luckiest lawyer in the world to have that job. <laughs> um, what exactly do you want to know about it? You asked a good question and I distracted by talking about my legal background. Okay, so for people who may not know, GNOME is a free software desktop. Um, for, um, it's it shipped on most Linux distributions uh, as the default desktop, or as I'm at the Libra Planet conference, <laughs> I should say GNU Linux distributions uh, as the default desktop. Um, and it's, um, it, if people aren't used to it, it, it's the visual interface that you would see um, if you're using the desktop. So it's what drives the windows, the mouse, etc. It, it's the visual look of it. So what makes GNOME different from other desktop software? Yeah, and I'd also add that GNOME is also uh, the backbone of quite a number of GNU Linux distributions. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of GNOME in uh, Ubuntu um, and also uh, Linux Mint, and um, the OpenSUSE distribution has uh, GNOME 3 as a default. Don't forget Fedora. And Fedora has GNOME. Yeah, well, I'm going through it. Okay. And also, <laughs> so Fedora and also uh, Debian uses uh, GNOME 3 as default as well. So, um, so it is actually um, uh, uh, pretty well deployed. And what makes GNOME different from other desktops, as you ask, is, um, well, it's just so pretty. <laughs> uh, so when I was sitting there as a, as a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center and GNOME 3 came out, I was astounded. I, you know, I hadn't really thought too much about this stuff before, except to be frustrated that um, it was hard to explain to, um, to non-GNU Linux users why I cared so much that I was using kind of an uglier desktop or, you know, I used my old computer and why freedom mattered so much. And when I saw GNOME 3, I was bowled over. It was so sleek and pretty and beautiful. And I felt like it was exactly the thing that we need to bridge the gap to new users and to users who, um, you know, who are just coming into this space. I mean, through my medical devices advocacy, and we may talk about that after, I'm not sure, um, but I come across a lot of people who are Mac users or people who don't really know too much about free and open source software, and the biggest complaint that they have when they start looking into it is that it's so difficult to use. And so what GNOME, and GNOME 3 in particular, has is that it's just, it's just so easy and so beautiful. So I, I'm really proud to be affiliated with it, and I think that it's made some great strides. We're about to release GNOME 3.4. Probably by the time this is posted, 3.4 will be out since it's just coming out on Wednesday, but there are a lot of amazing improvements um, that are, are coming in with 3.4, and it's only going to get better from there. So I believe the GNOME 3 slogan is made of easy. <laughs> um, which, well, I thought it was made of software. But, um, <laughs> so um, one of the most popular GNU Linux distributions, or Linux distributions, is Ubuntu. And Ubuntu has chosen to use its own separate interface called Unity rather than sticking with the, the GNOME 3 uh, GNOME 3 shell. So um, what was the, um, what's behind that? And is there a chance that um, the, those Unity can be unified, as it were, um, with the GNOME desktop? I think that's a great question. and. Um, I don't mean to turn the tables too much here, but uh, a lot of the decision to go to Unity happened before I became executive director of GNOME. Um, I've only been executive director of GNOME for seven or eight months now, and you, I believe, were an advisory board representative during that time. 
Well, <laughs> um, thank but, you. But I yes. mean, what I, I guess, I guess, what what is going on in the GNU Linux space is that we're realizing just what I said before, which is that we have a real challenge to reach new users and to reach um, um, unsophisticated users. I'm saying unsophisticated is that's really talking down to these users. I, I don't I don't mean it like that. I mean um, non-power users, not you know users that aren't developers, and and sort of. Understanding the fact that if free software is going to be successful, we have to reach a much wider audience. Um, and I think that that's also what Canonical is trying to do with Unity. And so both of these uh, these efforts are actually building on the same technology. So Canonical is still very active in the, in, in the GNOME community. They're still a member of our advisory board. And you'll see that the GNOME 3.2 press release had a quote from Canonical in it as well. So there's a lot of work being done together. And there's a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of sharing and a lot of um, combined efforts, which I think is really good. Um, and at the end of the day, there are two different competing desktop experiences, but that share a lot of technology. So there are actually three different competing desktop. Um, well, there's more there's, than that. Well, but this is true, <laughs> but the, the other popular one is KDE, which I believe these days just stands for the K desktop environment. Is there a chance, do you, do you guys work together with the other Linux desktop, which is KDE, and do you collaborate on technology? Well, actually, I, I would think that if we're going to talk about the main desktop environments, I think we, if we, and we, we talk about GNOME and we talk about Unity, we should also uh, talk about Linux Mint, which is built on GNOME 3 technologies, but is a distinctive environment. And then there are a whole other, uh, a whole other host of, um, of desktops that people like because they're tailored to their particular needs. And, um, and that's great. That's one of the benefits of free software is that we can take the technology that people make and and refine it and make it into something that we want. Um, KDE actually uh, predates GNOME um, as a project. There was a licensing problem when KDE was originally not launched 15 years ago. And after about six months, uh, the uh, uh, Miguel de Casa and uh, Federico and other uh, early GNOME developers decided that they wanted to fix that licensing problem and make a truly free desktop. And so two ultimately free desktops were born and they have been competing ever since. We do work with KDE quite a lot. We've had a couple of desktop summits. We do some hack fests together. We're trying to increase areas of collaboration wherever we can. So um, here's an interesting thing. The desktop, the Linux desktop is getting really pretty, uh, very easy to use, and yet on the plane uh, I was flying out here, I went to the bathroom and looked around. There was one old guy using a laptop, myself, who also mm -hmm. had a laptop, which I, I wasn't using. Um, another old guy who was using a laptop. Every other person using a computer on that plane was using a tablet PC, mainly an iPad. What is GNOME doing to address the complete change in computing that appears to be taking place, that desktop computing is for old people and everyone else uses tablets? That's a really good question. I would actually say that a few years ago, if you looked around on the plane, not that many people had laptops. Like, some people had laptops, but not that many. And I think that largely, the ta and this is actually just, I'm not sort of stepping away from talking on behalf of GNOME here, I'm just saying from, as an observer of technology in our society, that what I think a lot of these tablet devices are doing are replacing a niche that we haven't had before. So I think that people are doing things with those, uh, with tablet computers that are not necessarily replacing laptops, uh, but they're sort of, you know, addressing a whole new need that phones were sort of starting to get at but weren't, weren't quite. So I think that that makes it a little bit more complicated. I do think that there are, that the technology is changing and the way that we think about it is changing. And the number of people who expect to have access to it have changed, which is why you know all of these pushes in the you know, Linux environments to make uh, to make all of our interfaces very easy to use are, are coming from because we perceive the fact that people and again my mother hates it when I talk about her, but five years ago she would never have used a computer for anything. I kept every year I would try to do something. Mom, let's put our recipes in. You know, let's share it for me. You know, and nothing, 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 nothing. Now. She does everything. I mean, it's just basically technology has gone to a point. Her friends have started using it. Everybody started using it. She, you know, so people who didn't use computers before are using them, and that means there's a whole different kind of computer usage that's being represented in these tablets. And it's still early days for GNOME 3. So basically, we have gone and rebuilt GNOME as GNOME 3 and created this awesome, beautiful desktop environment. Um, and we'll have to see where it goes from here. 
So I know there are efforts to bring it onto tablets, there are efforts to bring it onto into the mobile space, and hopefully we'll, we'll make sure they get somewhere, but it takes time. And free software, unfortunately, sometimes, because of its very nature, because there's, they're community developed, because often they're nonprofit driven, it takes a little longer sometimes. But so, I hope we'll get there. So, so your talk today was actually about accessibility on the GNOME 3 desktop. Could you describe um, for able-bodied viewers what accessible accessibility on a desktop means and what it's for? Yeah, well as somebody pointed out in the question section of the talk, accessibility means a lot of things and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, accessibility to me means that people can use computers regardless of disability. So in the GNOME world, or, or the things that GNOME is most focused on, are visual impairments. So, um, and that's partly for historical reasons, but, um, but we have um, a lot of effort in trying to get the, um, the desktop much more usable by visually impaired users. Um, and I'd say that that's a, a very large portion of the accessibility efforts that we do. But we do other efforts as well. Actually, um, we have a testimonial on our website now uh, because we've launched an accessibility campaign with GNOME where we want to make 2012 the year of accessibility at GNOME. So you can donate on the GNOME website and give to our campaign. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but along with the campaign, to explain it to people, we've launched these testimonials from people who are, you know, who have disabilities, who are using GNOME um, for every day. And one of those is a, um, is a person with visual impairment who uses GNOME to, you know, basically to use a computer and make a living, but as a, as a developer. But we also have somebody who, I think, um, I should have looked this up before, I think he has cystic fibrosis and he is, um, he's severely disabled and he's just, thrilled that GNOME 3 makes it possible for him to use a computer at all by himself. So with, with GNOME 3, he, can, he says he can, you know, he, can he can search on the internet for music videos and talk with his friends, and he never thought he'd be able to do that by himself. So accessibility means a lot of things. For us, it means you know, we, will, we definitely want to push forward um, you know, making our, our desktop more usable by everybody, particularly people with particular disabilities like blindness. So the other thing that you're very interested in um, is uh, women in computing, and I believe that's the Ada initiative um, that you're associated with. Could you tell our viewers a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd love to, and it's actually two things, um, and I think one led me to the other, and the first one is the GNOME Outreach Program for Women, and Google is a sponsor of the program, and we're so grateful that Google sponsors interns in our, in, our, um, in our community. Because what our program does is we specifically um, invite women to apply um, and take on, it's inspired by Google Summer of Code actually, and it encourages them to come and take projects. They don't need to be um, development, although many of them are. We have marketing interns, um, design interns, um, you know, documentation interns. And what these women do is they come in and in order to apply, you must have made contributions already into the project. So it basically, it specifically invites women to come and um, participate in our community and tells them how to get started. And in order to even submit the application, you have to make contacts with people, talk to them, figure out what, you know, what the needs are in the project and make a, a real fix. So, um, so the program's been really successful and what we've done is basically systematically address all of those reasons why we think women have been excluded or have traditionally not been present in the free and open source software community. And at GNOME, it's been tremendously successful. A very high percentage of the women that participate in our program stay in our community. I think um, th there's a number that I, I think it's something like 40% of the women who participated um, in, the, in two rounds ago um, and the round before that not only stayed in our community, but were active in outreach. So either they were mentors or they were speaking on behalf of GNOME to get new people involved because they've had such a good experience. And so it's this kind of thing, and, and the GNOME community has changed so much since I first became involved with it many years ago, where now I go to a conference and there are women there. And not only that, they, there's a supportive community where, you know, sometimes when I have a bad day, uh, I posted a blog recently where I had, uh, I had spoken on a panel at South by Southwest and, um, my discussion was so like intellectual and high level, but I posted a photo of me and the other three panelists, and somebody commented on a specific part of my anatomy, oh, and it shocked me. And I realized I remembered. Oh, right. That's just gross. That's why I don't post photos of myself generally. But it was like you know, I'm already an, a seasoned member of our community. One bad comment isn't going to turn me away. But five years ago, I, I maybe would have just 
gone away. But I knew that I could go to the women's outreach forum on the GNOME, you know, server, and I could, you know, on the IRC channel, and we all talked about it, and, you know, three other people said I had that happen to me last week. And you know, it's unfortunate that it's so common, but we've provided an infrastructure, we've created ways that we can talk about it, which allows women to cope and understand that um, our community is more valuable and not just representative by the few bad actors. So the you know, outreach program, which has been fantastic, and um, uh, Marina, uh, who is uh, actually at Red Hat, but she does this, and she's amazing. She's the one who, um, who spearheads this effort, is incredible. You're laughing. No, I've, I've actually interviewed Marina. Um, <laughs> if people want to look back, you can find an oh. interview with her uh, on exactly this topic. Oh, okay. So I'll ago. skip to the ADA initiative. Yeah. Uh, which is, uh, so I've just recently become an advisor of that because I went to a conference in Melbourne when I was there for Linux Conf Australia, and um, they uh, they had this, it's called, it was called Ada Camp, and I was astounded by how many articulate, amazing, interesting women there were who had so much more information about women in technology than I ever had. I've been interviewed as a woman in free software in the past, and, um, and they, <laughs> following the old axiom that, uh, that in order to be an expert about women in free software, you just have to be one. Yeah. So, um, so, but, but these women had, had statistics, and they had real knowledge, and they had um, they had amazing recommendations of things that projects and um, free software projects, software projects, and software companies can do to make sure that they're actually um, encouraging women to participate. And so that's why I decided to affiliate with them and to support them. Their work is incredible. They've helped create um, codes of conduct for conferences, help deal with problems as they arise, help draw attention to the issue in the field. So it's great. The ADA initiative. That's really good. So um, that's a search term. If people want to find out more about it, um, because um, we could do with more women in engineering and in the free software communities. Mm. Um, so, so the other uh, interesting thing that you deal with is you uh, have a very interesting perspective on free software uh, as it relates to medical devices and why that's really important. And I don't want you to go into any specific details, but maybe you could just uh, explain to our viewers a little bit about um, how important that is. Yeah, I don't know how to how to explain it without at least getting into the specific story wow. of me, but I'll make it really short. And it's that, um, that I have a heart condition. I have, uh, I have a very big heart. Um, and I am fine, I have no symptoms, but I'm at a very high risk for suddenly dying. And I was already a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center when I was told that I needed a pacemaker defibrillator. So, uh, and I'd been, I'd been a, a, a programmer back in college. So my first question was, you know, well, what is, you know, what's the software on the device? And the doctor not only had no answer for me, he'd never thought about that question before. The medical device rep who came in, um, who happened to be there that day, also had never thought about that question and had no answer. And so I began this big discovery that, um, that to make a long story short, brought me to the realization that actually the Food and Drug Administration is not reviewing the source code on these devices, and because they're not asking for the, the source code to review them, um, to review it, they don't actually even keep a copy. So there are all these issues with the fact that we're relying on these uh, medical device companies for creating and testing their own software, which, you know, these companies have an interest in making sure that nobody dies, but, um, but when you have um, something that's being um, implanted into your body and being literally screwed into your heart, you sort of start to realize, well, why can't I look at the software that's on this device? And, and not only that, I, I actually even offered to sign an NDA. I, I wasn't even asking, like, please publish it to the world. I was just saying I would feel a lot better personally if I could take a look at the code. And that was a, a non-starter with these medical device companies. So what I've started doing is, in addition to the research about the legal ramifications and what the framework are, is to just sort of start talking about it and to sort of let people know that this is really a problem. The medical devices that we have right now fail. They're great, they're amazing devices, but they have software in them, and software has bugs. So over time, they will fail. And you know, just because software is available for review doesn't mean it will be 100% safe. It will also have bugs. But chances are, if there are problems, they'll be caught faster, that anyone can fix them. All of the reasons why free software is so great to work on and so great to have in your company's product are exactly the same reasons why it makes so much more sense to have it in medical devices, but on top of that, it's just an issue of public safety. So, you know, you can come at it from either just the sensible, these devices fail, and instead of, there are all these think tanks that are going around uh, researching these devices, and they're finding ways to show that they're maliciously hackable, 
And those same think tanks would be reviewing the source code line by line and finding problems so that they could be fixed. You know, I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of interest in this. And then once you start thinking about your medical devices and, you know, you think about all the software you rely on. It's not just my medical device. What about our voting machines? What about our cars? Our cars have been, um, there was a, a security exploit on, um, on cars where they could be remotely um, hacked into uh, through uh, the most amazing of ways and, um, and controlled, steered and um, uh, accelerated and uh, just amazing stuff. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's everything that we rely on and all that software interacts together. So we, we need our software that we rely on to be, society, you know, to be free and open. It, we're building just so much infrastructure, both you know, in our hearts, in our, you know, in our bodies, but also in our, in our society, our financial markets. And the only way that we'll create a, a, a good society going forward is by making sure that it's free and open. As, as I like to often say, eventually your doorknob is going to have a process in it <laughs> running software. And who controls the code in that will end up being extremely important yeah. going forward. So there's one final question I'd like to ask you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, but what I always like to ask people um, is for viewers who might not be currently in the free software community, uh, who might be thinking about it, how did you get to where you are? So, you know, imagine that you're a young woman, um, you know, in your late teens, early twenties. What advice would you give to someone like that to be able to end up in the august position of director of the GNOME Foundation? Well, people actually do ask me, especially law students, ask me how they can emulate my career path. And I tell them that I wish I were as organized as they are to even ask about it. I kind of, to be totally honest, just stumbled into these jobs. I, um, I would say that, um, that interest in technology for women happens very early. So um, I would say to, to all of you, um, if you, if you know of a, of a little girl, try to introduce them to, to some kind of technology because once you get past a certain age, for many, for many girls it's too late. Um, I, at the at Ada camp, we had a session where we talked about you know, how, how we can get more high school girls interested in technology. And I was like, hang on, let's stop for a second and let's go around the room really, really fast and say what we think our earliest positive technology experience was that we think is the most formative so that we could sort of think about how to create that for, for other girls. And almost everybody as I went around had a parent, notably a father, um, who had been interested in computers and who had encouraged us at a very early age. So I would say that, that I had a father who was uh, an engineer and he encouraged me from the get-go. And I'm very old in free software terms, so he encouraged me on Prodigy and CompuServe and I had a computer from the earliest, eight, earliest days where I was running basic and he, he, he looked at my, you know, 10 print quote Karen rules and said, oh, you know, you know, and go to 10. He, he, he was like, oh, you know what else you can do with this? You can do this, you can do that. So I'd say that was the earliest thing. And then I went to engineering school because I was on this technology path. And I worked in a computer lab where there were no women. And I went into the director and I said, you have no women in this this you know in this lab and all these women are walking in and it's so hostile and they leave and it's horrible can you do something and he said you're hired and 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 that's how I wound up like learning about computers and spending all my time in the computer lab and so you know it's it's part lucky and part and then I went to law school and I happened I didn't even know who Evan Moglin was and I happened to be in his his class on perspectives on modern legal thought and I was so moved by, he's an incredible speaker, and I was just so moved by his teaching that he was my favorite professor in law school. Then I went off and did securities law, and I decided I got fed up, and I quit, and he heard I quit, and he'd started the Software Freedom Law Center, and asked me if I wanted to learn about nonprofit law. And I was like, yes, but I hadn't actually thought about free software that much since the 90s, even though I thought it was cool. And then all of a sudden, I had the opportunity to be in the best spot in the world. And over time, I became really passionate about free software. And then I had the medical issue happen to me. And all of a sudden, my personal and professional were all combined. And so I've just been very, very lucky. So I would say, as an advice to someone who's starting out, I would say, first, you know, be open to new experiences. Don't think that the next choice you're going to make is forever. And, um, and try to do good work in the world. It, 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 it has good ramifications, and it helps you out in the end, too. 
thank you so much, Karen. That was really that was really kind of you to spend the time. I appreciate it. Thanks for interviewing me. Thanks.